Get Rich Education is brought to you by Norada Real Estate, Corporate Direct, and Mid-South Home Buyers. Garrett Sutton here, Robert Kiyosaki's asset protection attorney and the author of Loopholes of Real Estate. As an American or foreign-based investor in U.S. real estate, you know we are a litigious society. You know that you need to protect your real estate and paper asset holdings with the right mix of LLCs and corporations. My firm, Corporate Direct, not only forms these entities, but importantly, we properly maintain them too. If you fail to follow the corporate formalities, you can lose it all in an instant. Corporate Direct is your source for LLC protection and maintenance in all 50 states. Visit CorporateDirect.com or call 800-600-1760. Mention Get Rich Education for a free bonus. Switch your resident agent service to us and receive another bonus. It's all good. We look forward to assisting you at CorporateDirect.com. Welcome to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold, giving you information and ideas on the investment that has turned more ordinary people into millionaires and billionaires than anything else, and can provide you with more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, and educator, Keith Weinhold. Welcome to Get Rich Education, episode 90. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Here's hoping that you've lived an abundant week. We've got a more bearish guest on the show today, Harry Dent, with a lot of brazen, polarizing predictions that are going to give you pause and make you act. Harry is one of today's most prominent economic commentators, and he'll tell us that the Dow Jones Industrial Average is set to drop to 6,000 points by early next year and as low as 3300 after that. I'm going to ask him more about that today. Harry Dent will expose a lot of the nation's and world's structural economic deficiencies on today's show. In fact, he thinks that we are about to tilt over a cliff and people listen to Harry's predictions because the depth of his research is so extensive. Besides being a popular author, he runs Dent Research. The crash is coming, the carnage is coming, and we'll tell you what you can do about it. Now, Harry's a widely known name. If you aren't familiar with him, then you're likely newer to economics and finance, and that's okay because you're about to meet him here. Harry knows a bit about me. He knows that I've long been really into educating people about the enormous and life-changing positive benefits of buying cash-flowing real estate, mostly in the United States, Midwest, and South. Let's meet the incomparable Harry Dent. If you're in the economics and finance space, you already know that today's guest is a substantial influencer in this entire industry. He earned his MBA from Harvard Business School. Later at Bain & Company, he was a strategy consultant for Fortune 100 companies. You've often seen him on your television as he's appeared on Good Morning America, PBS, CNBC, CNN, Fox. He's appeared in tons of influential publications from the USA Today to Fortune Magazine to the Wall Street Journal. I can't even name them all pretty much everywhere. He is a mega best-selling author today, and he has been for years. He's the author of The Demographic Cliff and editor of the free newsletter Economy and Markets. Here he is. I want to give a big Get Rich Education welcome today to the Harry Dent. Well, thanks, Keith. Nice to be here. Yeah, it's really great to have you here. Now, Harry, you're very much in the prediction business. And, you know, I would imagine that it's got to be more difficult than ever to make economic predictions because economies and markets are controlled by irrational human beings. And you've got a manipulative Fed that seems to intervene more and more. And you've even got an election year this year. So tell us about the predictions and, and how that's got to be more difficult than it used to be. No, no, it, it's way more difficult the last yeah. years. Ever since QE, it's one thing to lower interest rates. Central banks have always done that and slowdowns. But to actually go in and start buying bonds and push into long-term interest, not just short-term, but long-term interest rates adjusted for inflation on a three-year average have been zero for years. Money is free, short-term and long-term. And when money is free, 
it will be used for speculation. It will be abused. It will pervert markets. Markets will, will deal more on speculation than real price discovery. So, so it's really a terrible thing for markets. And the type of indicators and cycles I have in study that show both when consumers are going to spend more or less or, or different cycles are going to change or when stocks just simply get overbought, you know, investors get too enthusiastic. Those don't really work that as well anymore because right. there's a constant bid under the market. I mean, at zero interest rates, there's always somebody buying and because there's nowhere else to go to get yield. And I actually saw an article recently, which I believe from watching these markets day to day in the last several months, is that literally the Fed is having somebody step in. Every time the market goes down a couple percent, they'll step in and they will buy S&P futures and stock futures up until the S&P gets back up to 2100 near the high. In other words, they're not trying to push markets to new highs. They're just trying to prevent a slide from beginning because markets are way overvalued again and very, very due for at least a 10 percent correction. And I think we could see 20 to 30 percent into the summer. So it, it is more difficult, but Fundamental trends are still fundamental trends. The baby boom stopped spending exactly when we said they would 20-some years ago in 2007. Japan collapsed in the early 90s when everybody thought they were going to take over the world, just like they think for China today. So demographics is the most predictable thing. But, you know, when you got markets that just go up, 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 yeah, Homer Simpson's not feeling this recovery, but, but the affluent, really? the top 1%, 10% are definitely feeling it. And the, actually the top 20%, of, of households in this country control over 50% of the income and spending. So they're the ones that are still doing well, yet our indicators are finally saying even they are going to slow down because they peak in their spending later than Homer Simpson. So we still say demographics is the most important thing to watch long term and everything, and nothing more driven by demographics than real estate. But car buying is set to peak here in late 2015, early 2016, and fall for over a decade, and nobody's going to see that coming. Nobody saw the housing collapse coming. We did, because housing peaks before the average household peaks in their spending. Automobiles peak way after at age 54, and that's where the baby boomers just hit at the end of 2015. So don't be surprised to see autos falling off a cliff, and don't be even more surprised to see Germany having one of the weakest economies in the next several years. Germany has a deeper demographic slide in spending ahead than even Japan had in the 90s. And Japan crashed when the rest of the world was booming. That's how powerful demographics are when consumers decide, hey, our kids have left the nest. We don't need a bigger house. And we don't need a minivan, you know, just a sports car or something to tool around in. And they start spending less. That human nature doesn't change in that way. Yeah, there's just so much to touch on there. And Quite a bit's changed, you know, just in the last 10 years. 10 years ago, the term quantitative easing didn't even exist. <laughs> and, and now if we have a troubled stock market, you know, some people are wondering, well, well aren't they going to jump in? Aren't they going to do something? Aren't they going to basically buy back their own bonds and print more money? So I say it's become the new normal because people are starting to ask questions that they didn't even ask 10 years ago. They're almost depending on this now. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what, you know, like bad news is good news. Like, you know, the jobs report comes out. Oh, my gosh, you know, 38,000 instead of 150 and 150 is lower than the 200 plus we've been getting for a while. But the market goes down at first and then turns around and says, yeah, but the Fed's not going to raise interest rates in June and probably not in July. So, hey, bad news is good news. So this is perverted is what I say. Markets are perverted. They're programmed to only go up. A healthy market goes up and then retraces and corrects and, and digests the gains and then goes up again in a stair stop fashion. Ever since early 2009, the markets have gone up and, and only seen some substantial corrections starting in late 2014, and now we're seeing more of that. So, so it's showing we're, we're starting to top. But the, you know, the markets just are programmed to go up. That's not a healthy market, and, and that means they keep getting stretched and stretched, and when they finally do go down— they're going to go down harder. I mean, it's like, like taking more of a drug. You know, Every time you come down from a high, you just take more of the drug. Well, at some point, you have to take so much of the drug, you end up dead or in rehab, you know, or hit the floor and in rehab. So that's where we're heading. Right. Well, yeah, Harry, we're largely a building your wealth through real estate-centric show, but one market affects another. And you know, if the stock market should plummet, that goes ahead and 
basically degrades the wealth effect and people feel less wealthy. Consumers behave differently. It affects real estate. It's all together. And I guess one of your more fantastic predictions is that you state that the Dow is set to fall to 6,000 points by early next year and possibly as low as 3,300 by 2020. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, what happened? I mean, every generation has a spending boom as more and more people raise families, buy houses, buy cars, send their kids to school and college, all this sort of stuff. It's very predictable. Like for the baby boom, the peak in spending for the average family is age 46. Well, we hit that in 2007, and we've had quantitative ever since to offset the decline. China, the fastest growing country in the world up until recently, their workforce growth peaked predictably in recent years, and now they're running up massive debt and overbuilding. Of, I mean, we're printing money. They're printing condos. They got more empty condos than <laughs> the rest of the world combined over there because that's the only way they can, can keep growing in the face of a, of a shrinking workforce and slowing urbanization. So this is cheating, and it's not a good thing. Businesses could never do that. In, in this country, if, if developers were overbuilding – apartments and houses and stuff, then the value of them would go down. Well, not in China. They just sit empty. Affluent people keep investing in condos because they think they can never go down and the government will never let them go down. And China's going to see the biggest, they've already started to see a huge stock crash again. They're going to see the biggest real estate crash in history. And, and it's true. I mean, I like where you're at because I think overall real estate values are overblown. They bubbled up like everything else, just not as extreme as stocks because stocks are more sensitive to quantitative easing and stuff. But basically, as home prices get more expensive or if home prices start going down and people say, well, gosh, what do they say? Well, I'm a young family. I'm a, a echo boom millennial family. Hey, I just want to rent. So, so like you say, renting and positive cash flow areas, renters are only going up and buyers are only going down in this expensive bubble market. And when it crashes, it'll be more so. So uh, I'm kind of with you. The way to make money in real estate is you have to buy properties in areas that are not as bubbly and then rent them out at positive cash flow. And, that, and that's the n number one sign. If you're in a bubbly area like San Francisco or Seattle or Vancouver or Manhattan or South Beach, you know, Miami and places like that or Austin, you're not going to be able to rent out for positive cash flow. You're going to have to subsidize your bubbly price to get renters to come in because they're not going to be able to afford it. So when you can rent out at a healthy, positive cash flow, it shows you're not in that bubbly of market. And cash and cash flow are the king to surviving a bubble burst because when the bubble burst, then you can just buy more real estate or stocks or anything at bargain prices. But you got to have cash and cash flow because when things get nasty, banks aren't going to loan you money. Yep. It certainly starts with cash flow. That is smart, fundamental buying. Yeah. I like to think of the Chinese ghost cities as kind of, in a sense, the inverse of what we look for as cash flow investors. When you buy a piece of turnkey real estate, 5% vacancy, like that's often a, maybe a good factor to shoot for. You've got 95% occupancy, 5% vacancy. Well, in Chinese ghost cities, you might have 5% occupancy in an entire city. That is profligate. That is wasteful. We're an increasingly interconnected and global economy, and that's got to catch up with people sometime. Yeah, and real quick, the, the vacancy rate in cities in general in China, two different surveys I've seen, one measured 27%. And they did it by electricity, condos and apartments and houses that are hooked up to electricity and using zero, which means it's empty. And another survey uh, estimated 24 percent. There is no real estate market I know in the world other than maybe Dubai, which is other also government manipulated like China, where if you had that sort of vacancy rates that real estate prices would be rising and not crashing. Yeah, that's what you want to see, 5% vacancy or 5% empty homes. You don't want to see 20%, 25%. That is crazy. Well, yeah, a lot of what we focus on is kind of like what you talked about here. You know, we focus in markets often that are in the United States, Midwest and South that do provide positive cash flow for a an investor that goes ahead and puts a 20% down payment on it. And we kind of focus on those markets that are boring. A lot of people call those the linear markets in my industry. And, you know, it's kind of the places that don't make the news and that are off the radar. The more often a place makes news, the less likely it is you want to buy there, I think. Yeah, yeah, no question. I mean, we are in a bubble, but bubbles, especially in real estate, are very uneven. I mean, I mean, the difference between San Francisco and Vancouver and Manhattan and Omaha, I mean, there's, there, you can't even compare. 
like you say, there, there's linear growth, which is normal and healthy most of the time. Exponential growth is what creates bubbles, and no market can go up for 15%, 20% a year in real estate and not crash. I was lecturing in Dubai for a major international conference and then a big conference for Tony Robbins out there, two, 2006 and seven. And both times I said, look, this Dubai real estate is going up even faster than South Beach, where I was living at the time in Miami. I, and that was a bubble. I said, this is a bubble and it's going to burst. And people say, Harry, you don't understand. The governments will step in and buy. The governments will step in and buy when people don't. You don't have to worry about. Oh, boy. So guess what? 2008 real estate dropped 40% in one year in Dubai. And I'm like, nah, 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 nah. Nothing can go up exponential and not, I mean, it, we're at the point where billionaires can't afford to buy in Manhattan. The condos, the top condos are going for 100, 120 million. And they've just got permit to put one on for 2018, $250 million for a damn box in the air. <laughs> just crazy. Even billionaires can't afford that at a point. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about the prediction business. I would imagine at least when you make predictions with stocks, it's somewhat easier to do just in the sense that the market isn't nearly as fractured. The stock market is efficient. The stock market's centralized, whereas the real estate market's very fractured and localized. Yes, much more local and regional. Also, you know, if, if I'm wrong on stocks in a bubble and, and they're down 20%, I say, okay, now it looks like it's bursting. At least I can get out. Real estate can freeze up very rapidly in a bubbly market. Again, I saw this in Florida in the last bubble burst. I mean, I, you'd have to stand in line one day and hope, you know, 10, 12 bids, and then all of a sudden there's no bids, uh, no buyers. So yeah, stocks are, are easier to predict short-term movements and more liquid. On the other hand, stocks, when they crash, they tend to crash a lot more than real estate. Let's talk a little bit about the real estate crash that took place in 2007, Harry, because you know what? It basically, in our entire lifetimes on a national basis, again, real estate's local, but on a national basis, real estate basically never went down in value until the year 2007, at least within our lifetimes. Yeah, it actually peaked in early 2006, but that's right. It, it didn't really start to go down significantly until 2007, seven, eight, uh, the subprime crisis. See, one of the things, this is actually an illusion because I study history way back. and I can go way back in Europe and places for real estate. And real estate is cyclical. It's generational like anything else. But we had two things happen in our lifetime, only in our lifetime, that will not repeat. Number one is only with the Bob Hope generation that came out of World War II in the late 40s. That was the first Middle class generation. We talk about middle class like it's always been. No, it wasn't. You know, there was an upper class and then there was a lower class. And this is the first middle class generation who could afford, most people could afford to borrow on a long term mortgage and buy a home after World War II with the help of the GI Bill and a very strong economy. So that was the Bob Hope generation. They weren't not just another generation coming along. They could much more broadly afford housing than the generation before them. And then follows them the unprecedented and massive baby boom generation. I mean, baby boom generation dwarfs the generation before and after it, especially the one before. So you had two generation cycles where real estate just went up. It went up because of broader buying, and then the baby boomers dwarfed you know, demand versus supply into 2005 or so, and then the boom was over. And I tell you, we're going to feel this for a long time, Keith, because there's a new trend in real estate that took me many years to figure out because I was watching Japan. Japan's my leading indicator because they, their real estate market and stock market and baby boom bubble hit, you know, 12 to 15 years before the U.S. And then the U.S. hit, you know, a few years before Europe. So Japan had their crash first and showed what happens when a large generation like the baby boomers stop buying real estate in mass, stop, you know, drive, spending money and driving the economy. But what happened was Japan's next generation, their echo boom came along starting in the late 90s for real estate. And I'm like, OK, we should see real estate start to come back up. Not as high as before because it's not as big a generation by far, but we should see some bounce. We saw almost no bounce. And I'm, for years, I scratched my head. Why would they? OK, yeah, young people don't feel as 
the jobs are good. Yeah, they don't feel as secure. They don't want to have sex, all this sort of stuff, you know, and they delay marriage. And okay, I get that, but still didn't explain. And then I finally figured out when I saw in a magazine that, that uh, adult diapers for Japanese had surpassed baby diapers for the first time <laughs> in history. And I said, you know what? In housing, people dying. Dyers are sellers, and housing lasts forever. So it has a bigger impact on that than anything else. And now my new indicator is not just a 41-year lag for peak home buying by a generation. I, I take the peak buying trend and then I subtract the dyers who are now sellers. So I get net home demand. And in Japan, that peaked way back in 1991 and has been declining ever since. And then doesn't turn around for another decade. U.S., after a little rise recently, that net demand, because baby boomers are going to start dying faster, heads down modestly continually till 2039. Real estate on the demand side for buying homes is never going to be the same. Again, not in our lifetimes. It was extraordinary in our lifetimes, and now we're going to see a backlash the other way. Baby boom, baby bust. And again, it wasn't just there stopping buying and slowing and buying, which is natural. It's the fact that at one point, there's going to be more baby boomers dying than young new families who are buyers. And most of the real estate is bought between age 27 and 33, starter home buyers. And so these young buyers are being offset in Japan, and they're going to be increasingly being offset by dying baby boomers here. So it's another reason I tell people, if you buy real estate, only buy it because you want to live in forever or fix it up, or you buy it for the income and rent it out. You don't buy it like Jed Clamp and think, I'm going to sit on this and get rich because it's going to go up at 10 20% a year. That is never. I'm not, that's my prediction today. Real estate in most places in the U.S. and Western world is never going to appreciate like it did from 1983 to 2006. Not going to happen again. So you have to either, again, buy it because you love it, or you buy it and you say, I'm going to value this based on the rents I can get for this in the future. That's what it's worth, not appreciation. Well, I'm going to ask Harry more about demographics in a moment here. You're listening to Get Rich Education. Our guest is Harry Dent. More when we come back. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Cashflow real estate investors nationwide and worldwide. This is Get Rich Education's Keith Weinhold. Forbes has rated Memphis, Tennessee as the number one cash flowing market in the world. Our good friends at Mid-South Homebuyers have been Memphis's premier turnkey real estate provider for 14 years with a stellar reputation and an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. Owner Terry Kerr was born and raised in Memphis. Yeah, he knows the market and has renovated and sold over 1,000 houses in the Memphis area. Find out what their many repeat buyers already know. Their houses are completely renovated even come with a one-year builder's warranty and a lifelong rental guarantee. They're a perfect fit for the first-time out-of-state investor or the seasoned investor diversifying their portfolio. Mid-South Homebuyers friendly staff makes investing easy. Learn more at midsouthhomebuyers.com or give them a call at 901-217-HOME. Are you looking for a roadmap to financial freedom? If so, we have a solution for you. Narada Real Estate is offering a limited number of free strategy sessions to help you get out of the rat race. Learn how you can create wealth and build monthly passive income. To set up a time with one of our knowledgeable investment counselors, simply go to naradarealestate.com. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com. This is our Rich Dad, Poor Dad author, Robert Kiyosaki. Listen to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold. Don't quit your daydream. Welcome back to Get Rich Education with our guest, Harry Dent, the author of The Demographic Cliff, harrydent.com. So you are Mr. Demographics. Your latest book, The Demographic Cliff, you know, it really helps illustrate and underscore some of the changes that we're seeing. And one of those changes is, like you talked about before the break, we've got more would-be buyers becoming renters, and there's a number of factors for that. Student loan debt, even on an inflation-adjusted basis, is quite, 
quite high. And that means that would be buyers, they can't quite form that first down payment because they're being weighted down by that student loan debt. We do have delayed marriage. As soon as marriage takes place, that leads to household formation and usually buying a home, not renting. And you know, another thing, Harry, that millennials see today is millennials, they saw through their own eyes what their parents went through. They saw the value of their parents' home fall. They saw their parents' home go underwater where the mortgage balance was even greater than what the home could be sold for. And oftentimes that geographically fixed someone to where they were so that they couldn't even move. So that often has a strong effect on millennials. So they kind of have this negative connotation with home ownership, and they're going to be renters for investors like me. Yeah, Keith, I mean, no question. They know what I know historically that real estate can go down and it can go down significantly. And if it goes down on a mortgage, you're leveraged, let's say, five to one. So a 10% decline is a 50% decline on the money you put down. So yeah, baby boomers never even thought real estate could go down and it never went down for their lifetimes until recently. So yeah, it's it's all of those things. And student loans are $1.2 trillion. It's more than all the credit card debt and, and things like that. That is significant for somebody getting out of college. And okay, the next thing you want to do is get married and buy a home. Well, I've got 30,000, 50,000, 80,000 student loan debt at six, seven percent higher than a mortgage. Yeah, how can I add a mortgage to that? And how can I save for a down payment with those sort of payments? So, you know, I think the, the Great Recession, the real estate decline, it did have a big impact because marriage has been stepping up over time gradually, but it jumped two years. The average age of marriage for men and women jumped two years since the Great Recession, just in the last several years. So, it really did have an impact on this generation. And when you study generations in history, they are different because people form their images of life and, and their feelings about life when they're coming of age in their late teens and early 20s. And so the Bob Hope generation before the baby boom was nothing like the baby boom. They come, come into the Great Depression the economy, and then World War II, the worst war in history, they were way more conservative, way more saving for a rainy day view than the baby boomers. Baby boomers just borrowed money and thought things would be good forever. And had, they grew up in the happy days of the 1950s, you know, when they were younger and then the 1960s. So this generation is going to continue to think this way. I think this generation is going to have more renters, even when the economy gets better, even when real estate starts to come back. But I don't think my view is real estate especially in the bubbly areas, will never get back to these levels. And it's not going to come roaring back after the next downturn because of this dyers versus buyers. So this generation is going to see that. And again, it's, it, it becomes a different decision. It's like for the baby boomers, if you don't buy a home, you're crazy because you're going to miss out on the easiest way to make money while you sleep. But for the echo boomers, it's going to be, hey, if I buy a home – great. Uh, if I really love it and think I'm going to be here. But, but what if I'm still searching for my career and I want to be flexible? I don't want to buy a home and have to sell it if I want to move to Denver, because that's a better place to get a job than, than you know somewhere else. So I think they're going to think differently and they're going to weigh it. And it's going to be this, hey, yeah, buying has its advantages. Renting has its advantages. And I, and I think the general markets that I see and trends I see are going to tend to favor, hey, renting over buying. Yeah, because for people, and especially young people, that mobility, that ability to be a renter, that mobility is actually a career asset. It is. And, and again, you got to remember, I mean, jobs, the unemployment for the youth is higher than normal in this recovery because the baby boomers didn't save enough for retirement. Now the economy's weaker and their home values and stock values are weaker and stuff. And so they're staying in the workforce longer. So, so this, yeah, this mobility is an advantage. And it's just another thing. Oh, we don't have to buy homes like it's a sure way to make money. Oh, X that. That's not happening anymore. Yeah. Being mobile, you know, worrying about your cash flow with high student loans, all of these things. I'm getting married later, having kids later. I mean, the biggest trigger for buying a home is not getting married. It's having kids. So people are not only getting married two years later, they tend to be delaying having kids. The typical first home is bought about three years after people have their first kid. So you have that kid, now you say, oh my God, we gotta settle down, we gotta be respectable people in a good neighborhood, in a good school district. That's when you start thinking buying a home. So all this delaying marriage and kids is just gonna continue to mean this generation will rent longer. And, and, and in fact, I just put out a, an article the other day in my newsletter 
that for the first time in all of history, there are more people 18 to 34 living with their parents, 32.6%, than living as a married or cohabitation couple. First time in history. Yeah, that is potentially quite significant. So I really want to know, Harry, I guess you talk about an upcoming economic crash potentially. I guess I want to know how bad will it all get and just how bad does it look? And I think I want to preface this with something. You know, a lot of people that, that listen to Harry Dent, you're a very popular commentator, you're on television, you're on the internet, you've got a lot of books. Some people might mislabel you as a perma bear, permanently a bear. But back in 1992, you wrote the book, The Great Boom Ahead, where you stood virtually alone in accurately forecasting the unanticipated economic boom of the 1990s. And the depth of your research is so extensive that people really listen to you. So I don't think that you're a perma bear. And I just want to know, how bad will it get? How will this next economic crash actually manifest itself? What's it going to look like for the everyday American that has a 40-hour week job, two kids, and a 401k? People that aren't well-informed, people that don't listen to this show. What's it going to look like for them? Well, it's not going to look good. And again, I'm not a bull or a bear. I study history, and, and markets go up and they go down. It's true of real estate. It's true of stocks. It's true of commodities. It's true of everything. There's nothing that does not go in cycles. So I'm really a cycle person much more, and, and that a cycle person is never a perma bull or perma bear, and I've been bullish for most of my career because the baby boom created the most bullish trends in history along with the Internet and information technology. But the problem is the greater the boom or the greater a bubble, and we got bubbles everywhere, the greater the burst. That's another just cyclical thing. And that's why, as you said earlier, the real estate in the middle parts of the country, in the Midwest and upper Midwest and in, in the South, East and up, not along the coast, not in areas where it's scarce and high density, those areas are not going to bubble as much, which means they're not going to go down as much. And the places that people think can never go down, like Manhattan and downtown San Francisco and Vancouver, I am telling you, those places are going to crash so bad, billionaires are going to be weeping in the streets. You know, bought that $120 million condo and realized it was really only worth $20 million, what it was worth, you know, 15 years ago before the bubble started. So my forecast is bad. Stocks, when you go through a generational downturn, go down at a minimum about 60% before the next generation comes along and you correct things. And in a, a deflationary bubble burst like this, like the roaring 20s going in the 1930s, the typical stock decline, and Japan's already seen this, is 80%. The typical real estate decline in urban areas is 60%. Japan's already seen that. We're heading for both of those. A stock market that's down 80% or more from the top and real estate that's down 50, 60% or more in general. But again, it's going to vary incredibly in the stock market between the most aggressive stocks and the most conservative. And it's going to vary even more in real estate. There's no way Omaha is going down that much, you know, or Cincinnati or places like that. But and, and most of Texas didn't bubble up in the last boom. But with the fracking thing, now Houston and Dallas have bubbled more. Austin downtown is $1,000 a square foot minimum for a condo. Austin used to be affordable. No more. So I, I tell people, Keith, in real estate, the best single gauge, since it is so varied, is look at pre-bubble. What was the apartment building you own, the office building, your house, the vacation home, what was it worth in January of 2000? It's not a perfect indicator, but it's the best single indicator just to get a gauge. Gosh, is my property bubbled up a lot or not? If you're anywhere near that level, then, then you've got little downside. But most places, you're two to three times that level. You know, your house was worth 200000 back then. Now it's worth six or 700000 Oops, you got a lot of downside, especially if you've got a mortgage against it. That's a great and really tangible indicator for somebody. So, you know, in a crash, do you think that one should have a little bit of cash in the banks or where? And I want to preface that a little bit, Harry, because Increasingly, we saw many of the world's economies go to basically a zero interest rate policy, and now more are adopting a negative interest rate policy. And if we have negative interest rate policy come to the United States, or if you're in a country where there's already negative interest rate policy, and this is often counterintuitive for a listener here, if you put money in the bank, you need to pay the bank to hold on to that money for you in a negative interest rate policy. So in a negative interest rate policy, you think one is better off rather than having a little bit of liquidity in the bank to have it in gold because you're not paying that premium to store it in the bank? Keith, I don't like gold. I've been preaching against gold for many years. Gold was a bubble, went up even more than stocks, like eight times in 10 years. 
and that bubble is bursting. And, and the reason it's bursting is all commodities are going down and it's been the biggest bubble to burst so far. But the other reason is gold is an excellent, and I mean more than excellent, the single best inflation hedge in the world, along with silver, but mainly gold. And what we have is we have a deflationary here. All this debt when it finally deleverages, we're going to destroy money that was created out of thin air by the banks. All these bubbles created artificial wealth in stocks and real estate and commodity stuff, and it's going to disappear and not come roaring back. And so money is going to shrink, and money shrinks. That means less dollars chasing the same goods. It means deflation. Gold does not do well in deflation. And in 2013, after money printing just went up the roof and Japan tripled their QE, that was the biggest move made, and they're doubling down again, gold finally realized they pulled out all the bazookas and inflation is still falling down to near zero. And that's when gold got it and gold dropped from $1,800 to 1150 in, in just a matter of months. And we were telling people, you know, we got people to sell gold and silver at, at the top in silver at $48 an ounce. In late April of 2011, gold peaked about 5% higher in September, and they've both been down ever since. They're, they're going lower. So that's not the place. What you want to do is have your money not so much in a bank account, because banks lend money against real estate and loans to companies, and they, they can lend 10 to 1 on their reserves or their capital. So they may not have your money if, if there's enough of a real estate or economic crash. You want to have minimum to do business, and then you want to have your money in a financial brokerage account under your name. It can be at a bank, at a brokerage firm, at, a, at an online brokerage firm. And there you can put your money in safer short-term fixed income or treasury bills when you want to be more conservative. And banks can't lend against that. That's your money. And so when, it's there, when you need it, you can say, okay, I need to withdraw $10,000 from my bond fund. Okay, it's yours. People went in the 30s and said, hey, I want my money back. Say, sorry. The banks, a lot of the banks had to say, we don't have it. We lent it out on real estate and farms and stuff, and now it's gone. That is a really interesting thing to say. So rather than have your short-term liquidity in a bank, have it in Scott Trade or E-Trade, because Scott Trade and E-Trade don't practice fractional reserve lending and other policies like the banks do. Exactly. And, and you know what? I also... Even with a broker, an online brokerage firm, I want to make sure they're not in the business of making real estate loans on the internet because there, there was one firm I really liked because it was very international and stuff, but I found out, oh, they're making real estate loans. So the firm might get hurt, even though your account's in there and it might get frozen for a while. So yeah, I mean, I've got my money in Scott Trade. Accounts like that, all they do is transactions. That's all they do. They make seven bucks every time I make a trade sort of thing, you know, and 200 bucks every time I buy an option or people like me. And that's what I want. I've got an account in them. It's my account. It's my money. They don't lend against it. They're not in the real estate business. They're not in the lending business. And that's what I want to have my money in. When I feel better about the markets, I can buy stocks and commodities and stuff and maybe even gold at times. I mean, I've been, I've been bullish on gold recently because it got so clobbered, but I think gold in the next year is going to head down again and be probably at least $700 an ounce in the next few years and, and ultimately could fall down to 400 because that's where the bubble started. That's one of my principles, Keith, and saying that's why I said January 2000. That's when the real estate bubble generally started in the U.S. and most countries in the world. And saying stocks, it's you know it started in late 94. So I use that's why I say stocks ultimately could fall as low as 3,800 on the Dow because that's where the stock market was when the tech bubble started in late 94. And that's bubbles tend to erase themselves because they're just erasing the bubble. They're not erasing real hard won gains, just speculative gains. So it's a good thing to understand bubbles. And, I, and I've got a book coming out soon, probably in the next month called The Sale of a Lifetime and why if you do have cash and cash flow policies in, in your investments and then be more safe. When this crash happens in real estate broadly, in the best cities and the best vacation areas and in stocks and you know the best tech stocks and global stocks and all this sort of stuff, you'll be able to buy stocks at 10, 20, 30 cents on the dollar, real estate at 20, 30, 40, 50 cents on the dollar and, and say, oh my gosh, this is how you get wealthy quickly. Okay, Harry. Well, this has been a very interesting discussion. As we wind down here, why don't you just tell us a little bit more about demographics? And oh, actually briefly tell us what the demographic peak is and maybe how that relates to real estate since you did write your latest book called The Demographic Cliff. Yeah. I mean, what we've had is one 
country and region around the world see this peak in baby boom spending. Japan hit it first in 89 and the second wave in 96. There were two peaks in Japan, and I was well aware of that. And ever since, they've been on, addicted to QE just to grow at 0% and have zero inflation and not go into deflation and an actual depression. And of course, that's not going to work forever. The United States was the next to get hit in 2007. Europe gets hit, you know, three years on a lag for us, but they've got other problems. And so they've been sinking early. But Europe's got the worst demographics. And Germany, in the next eight years, has the worst demographics of any single country in the world. And everybody thinks Germany's going to hold up Europe. They don't have a chance of holding up Europe any more than Japan had a chance of holding up Asia when their demographic slide hit. So it's very simple. Around the world in developed countries, people tend to peak, at least for the baby boom, around age 46 in the United States, more like 47 in Europe and Japan and East Asia because they have less immigrants and the immigrants tend to pull the averages down a little bit. So you just move forward the birth index for the peak in spending and that'll tell you when you're going to have a boom. That was 1983 to 2007 for the United States. That was the baby boom, boom in spending. And I said that and back in 1988, my first book hey, we're going to peak around 2007, and then we're going to slide for 12 to 14 years. And I said, Japan's going to slide for 12 to 14 years, starting in 89. People thought, why? That doesn't make any sense. Well, this is the most important fundamental trend, and economists don't have a clue, not even a clue that it exists, which is embarrassing, something so simple and so projectable. It's the one thing I can project. I, I can tell you which country is going to boom or bust decades in advance, and, and I lecture a lot in Australia, and they've got such high immigration that their echo boom is way larger than their baby boom, one of the few countries in the world. So if I wanted to buy real estate longer term, I'd, I'd rather buy there in the next crash than in places like the United States or Japan. And Japan's never turned around 26 years later after their crash because of this dying versus buying thing. So demographics is the one predictable thing. And Overall spending is age 46 to 47 in most countries. Real estate, as I said earlier, peaks on the early side around age 41 with trade-up homes. Auto spending is the last big category, peaks at age 54 with more affluent buyers who are buying Lexuses and BMWs and that sort of stuff and, and sports cars and badass pickup trucks, you know, and that's what's been booming there. And that's going to fall off. So, so you can predict segments of, of the economy and you can predict the general economy in developed countries out decades. And in, in emerging countries like China or India, I use workforce growth because they don't have as dramatic a spending curve as we do because they're in commodity-like industries generally. And I, you know, I said decades ago, China is going to be the first emerging country to see their workforce shrink. It's already shrinking starting in 2012. And guess what? They've been pushing people to move to urban areas. And these rural migrants who are illegal in these urban areas are now moving back home because they're sick of the pollution. They're sick of the, the, of the traffic and they're sick of the high real estate prices, they're moving back to the farms. You know, Harry, I just thought of one more thing I, I want to work in and ask you here, because we kind of touched on it earlier. Today with manipulated markets, it's probably more difficult than ever to make shorter term predictions. However, you are often making more reliable longer term predictions with demographics. Well, one longer term phenomenon is that of technology. And technology has a greater role in our lives. And, you know, we've already seen things today we couldn't imagine 15 years ago where we all have basically computers in our pockets now. And we see more things coming online or have already been online, but having more of a user friendly interface and an effect in our lives like autonomous cars or 3D printing or phone apps that are able to take your body's vital signs. Can technology save us from profligate monetary policy or an economic cliff in any way? I mean, I can't think of any way that it could. Do you see any way that it could? It can. It's not going to. I'll tell you why. This is my late. I, I've added three major long-term indicators to my demographics one. And the most recent was basically innovation cycles. There's always innovation. But what, what makes a difference for, for the economy is when major innovations like automobiles and electricity are moving mainstream, not when they're in niche markets. They were in niche markets in the early 1900s or roaring 20s. They moved mainstream after World War II. So every 45 years, we see an ebb and flow there. We've just seen a peak in the impact of the internet. It's not like the internet's not going to get better. Now we've got social media and all this stuff. But look, social media is like watching dancing cats and stuff. You know what I'm saying? The Google changed my business. I do 
three times the research with half the staff because of Google and email. Because all I do is research and write. It changed my business enormously. Social media can help on the marketing side, but, but for me and what I do, it's not as powerful as something else. I've got a serious newsletter to market. I'm, you know, it's not the type of thing you market on Facebook like you could, you know, vitamins or something or the, the latest skin cream or something. So this cycle peaked in 2010, just like it peaked in 1965 with automobiles and railroads in 1920 before that. It's one of my most clock-like cycles. And it says, look, there's going to be innovations, but they're not going to be game changers until about 2032-4. That's a long time from now. All of my other key cycles point down into 2020 or 2022 at the latest and then turn up. This is the one cycle that does not turn up. So innovation was a big part of this boom. It wasn't just the baby boomers. It was the internet, the information revolution and globalization, which was allowed by that. And that has had its peak impact. So I see innovations slowing. In fact, even Moore's law, the doubling of semiconductor chip power, you know, every two years or whatever, that's been going on ever since I can remember, that they're saying is clearly slowing rapidly. So this innovation cycle has seen its best for now. Innovations are even more important than demographics long term because we are standard of living right now is eight times what it was at the turn of the last century in 1900 before autos and electricity and phones and radios and TVs and then computers changed our life forever. So there's nothing more important than innovation. I'm just saying we're not going to see the same productivity and progress there that we saw from 1988 to 2010 when that cycle was when the internet, broadband, wireless phones, and all this stuff was moving mainstream at the speed of light. Everybody's got this stuff now. Well, Harry, this has been a super interesting discussion. You know, as investors, we always want to know what's coming next so that we can anticipate things and be profiteers as investors. Is there anything else that I should have asked you, but I did not? Well, you know, I think the biggest thing is just understand bubbles. Everybody gets on TV and say, oh, real estate's not in a bubble. New York's not in a bubble. Stocks are not in a bubble. Tech stocks are not in a bubble. I'm sorry. I've never seen more bubbles in my life, and I've studied every damn bubble in history back to the 1600s and farther back. We are in the greatest bubble in modern history. The baby boom was a bubble generation because of its massive size, putting supply versus demand everywhere, real estate, stock, you name it, products. And with this zero free money, which has never occurred long term and short term, that only encourages speculation. So we are in bubbles, and, and the best thing about a bubble is get out of the way of it. Don't think you can buy and hold in a bubble, not real estate, not stocks. Only buy stuff that can pay off, as you do, cut positive cash flow. Do not sit there and think, I'm going to buy a $20 million condo in New York, and it's just going to keep going up at 10 20% a year. It's going to go down. If you can't rent it out for good positive cash flow, you are buying a bubble property. And with stocks at ratios they are to sales and earnings, this is as bubbly as any time except for early 2000. So recognize bubbles. I always say if it looks like a bubble, walks like a bubble, quacks like a bubble, it's a bubble. We are in bubbles. And all of this government stimulus and quantitative easing is only extending a bubble that would have naturally peaked in real estate and stocks earlier. They've only brought the bubble back higher in most places. I mean, I used to live in South Beach. I couldn't even afford, even on my income, which is substantial, I couldn't afford to get a condo like I had been back then. Could not. That's why one reason I'm in Puerto Rico. I can get a great, super view, high lifestyle condo here in Condado in, in San Juan at a quarter of the price of a similar quality condo and view in South Beach. That's why I'm here. I'm not even here for the tax benefits yet. Yes, I didn't even mention earlier, Harry is in San Juan, Puerto Rico today, and I'm in Anchorage, Alaska. So we're kind of spanning uh, different uh, ends of the continent here, if you will. Harry, how can our listeners find out more about you? Best way, harrydent.com. We have a free daily newsletter, and it's, it's a way to get to know us better. And then, of course, we have a whole levels of newsletters and services and, and special reports and everything from real estate to stock investing for, you know, for people. But, you know, get to know us first. We are different. We have totally different indicators. I'm an economist, but I was not trained as an economist. I learned the hard way in business and business consulting and starting businesses and all this sort of stuff. So I have a different approach. And most people say, wow, you make a lot more sense than other people. Well, 
get on our uh, daily newsletter and you'll understand how we think differently and be ahead of this crazy bubble era. Listeners, understanding a subject well, including investing, means understanding a lot of points of intersection and being able to view things through a different lens and making the best decision for yourself. And Harry Dent could very be one of those perspectives for you. Harry Dent, thank you so much for coming on to Get Rich Education today. Okay, thank you, Keith. All right, well, very engaging material there. I took a few notes during our chat here. The Dow is set to fall to 6,000 by early next year and could fall as low as 3,300 later, according to our guest. Now, personally, I don't know whether that will happen or not, but, you know, it sure is interesting to listen to a well-researched position like that. Interesting comments on gold down to $700 or less in the next few years. Don't maintain your liquidity in a traditional bank, but rather keep it in a financial brokerage account like Scott Trade or E-Trade. Very interesting. I had not heard that angle before. Harry says this generation will rent longer. Harry says to buy property for cash flow. And I've got to tell you, it makes me feel pretty validated in what we do here at GRE because that's what we do here. And I had no idea that he was going to say those things before I hosted him here. So it's always a good idea for you to get a contrarian perspective, one that runs counter to the mainstream. And Harry offers some great ways to do that. Right now, Harry Dent's giving away a free copy of his massively popular book, The Demographic Cliff. You get that by going to harrydent.com. One just pays $4.95 for shipping and handling. And you can also check out Harry's popular free newsletter called Economy and Markets. So again, to you, being a savvy investor means viewing economic and housing forecasts through different lenses in various points of view. Personally, I like very much that today's guest, again, somewhat validated what you and I focus on here at GRE with income property purchased primarily for the production of cash flow in these sort of stable, non-flashy markets like we talk about here. From a big picture economic perspective like we got today, you know, it's kind of like I like to say, do the right thing, then do things right. Okay, do the right thing, only then do you concern yourself with doing things right. You know, the world changes and you've got to check in once in a while to be sure that you are doing that right thing. We squarely are. Only then do you concern yourself with doing things right within that carefully chosen right thing of income property. Okay. Special thanks to our feature guest, Harry Dent, today. We are building your wealth every week here. Until next week, I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Building massive passive income means that you might quit your day job, but don't quit your daydream. You've been listening to Get Rich Education, telling you what the wealthy won't tell you about real estate and investing. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to visit iTunes and leave your comments. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.